Okay, uh, welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public hearing and public meeting on Thursday, March 25th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting uh, law, uh, General Laws Chapter 30A, Paragraph 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This hearing and meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. The public can listen to the proceedings by visiting the town's homepage and navigating to the town calendar toward the bottom of that page. Clicking on the meeting schedule for March 25th, where the Zoom link and telephone uh, connections can be found. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. Um, I'll now take attendance by roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, uh, unmute yourself, answer affirmative, affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. Patricia Off. Present. Robin Fordham. Present. Uh, Janet Marquardt. Present. Do you want me to take minutes since the other Jane isn't here? Thank you. That That'd would be great. That would be great. Thank you. Um, uh, Jane Scheffler is not here. Hetty Startup. Present. And Jane Wald, I'm here too. Uh, so I have a few housekeeping comments. Um, for board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then, co uh, then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Ben know through the chat. Uh, discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. To maintain an orderly discussion, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, I'll see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. Ben Brager will assist me in keeping track of commission members who wish to be recognized. After speaking, uh, please remember to re-mute yourself. Uh, to members of the public, opportunity for public comment will be provided during the public hearing and during the general public comment period. Uh, and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware uh, the commission will take note of comments, but will not necessarily respond to them during public comment periods. If members of the public wish to make a comment during a public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link or video conferencing li link uh, explained above. Uh, these links uh, can be found on the town homepage calendar listing and on the meeting agenda. Uh, again, for members of the public, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand, the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the commission chair. Uh, if, uh, if the speaker exceeds their allotted time, uh, their participation may be disconnected. So moving on to the public hearing, uh, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 13, Demolition Delay, of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following demolition application requests. Uh, first, North Amherst Library, uh, map 5A, parcel 38, owned by the town of Amherst. This is a request for the partial demolition of the north wall and chimney of the approximately 1893 library to enable a proposed addition to attach to the existing library. 
Uh, next will be uh, 37 North Pleasant Street, map 14A, parcel 49, owned by Barry Roberts. This is a request for the full demolition of an approximately 1900 wood frame two-story commercial building. Copies of the demolition permit application and other historical information on the affected properties are available at this hearing. The public hearing is now open. Um, I will take just a few minutes to explain the goals and procedure for this public hearing. So I, I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, section 13 of the town's zoning bylaw governing demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance declares that as a matter of public policy, the economic, cultural, and aesthetic standing of the town of Amherst can best be maintained and enhanced by due regard for the historical and architectural heritage of the town. By striving to discourage the destruction of such cultural assets, the protection, enhancement, perpetuation, and use of structures of historical and architectural significance located within the town of Amherst is a public necessity and is required in the interests of the prosperity, civic pride, and general welfare of the people. So that's a, a quote from the bylaw itself. Under Massachusetts general laws in the town of Amherst, zoning bylaw, the Amherst Historical Commission is responsible for enacting the purposes and procedures of this policy. So the procedure for the public hearing will be that the commission will hear testimony as follows. Uh, first, uh, a report or presentation by the applicant. Second, additional information from town staff, if any, uh, anything new has arisen. Third, questions from commission members. Uh, fourth, a request for public comment or public testimony. Uh, fifth, the applicant's response to such comments. Sixth, final comments and questions from uh, the members of the Historical Commission and staff. Seventh, at the conclusion of public comment, the hearing will then be closed or continued to a future date and time certain. Once closed, the Historical Commission will begin deliberations based on review of standards for designation as a significant structure enumerated in section 13.4 of the zoning bylaw, uh, as well as information filed with the demolition application and testimony received during this hearing. For the benefit of members of the public attending this meeting, the Historical Commission's deliberations may result in one of three outcomes. Uh, it may be that, a that the commission reaches a finding that the building is not a significant structure according to bylaw criteria. In that case, the demolition permit is approved. Second, uh, a finding that the building is a significant structure according to bylaw criteria but that the proposed demolition would not be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage or resources of the town. In that case, the demolition permit is approved. Third, uh, there may be a finding that the building is a significant structure according to bylaw criteria and that the proposed demolition would be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage or resources of the town. In that case, the demolition permit may be delayed uh, the Historical Commission may put conditions on, uh, on its decision. Finally, uh, it is understood that the purview of the Historical Commission in this public hearing is only to assess the public interest in preservation of existing structures. According to the current bylaw, it is outside the scope of this Commission's deliberations to consider or comment on subsequent use of the site or pending development plans. Those concerns can be transmitted to the Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, or Design Review Board as appropriate. So now we'll turn to the first uh, demolition permit request. This is North Amherst Library, Map 5A, Parcel 38, owned by the Town of Amherst. 
This is a request for the partial demolition of the north wall and chimney of the uh, approximately 1893 library to enable the proposed addition to attach to the existing library. So first I'll invite uh, a report or presentation from the applicant. And I see uh, Chris Farley is with us. Oh, good afternoon. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Farley. I'm an architect with Kuhn Riddle Architects in Amherst. Um, and um, I, uh, I think have what I think is a, a very a brief uh, presentation. Um, ben, should I go ahead and share my screen? Sure, yeah, if you have it up, uh, you can go ahead and do it. Um, I also have the application. Uh, okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and, 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 and share it. Um, so uh, the, the North, North Amherst Library, um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of jump right to the, 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 the proposed demolition uh, and the purposes for it. So um, the, uh, we've been working with the town uh, and have designed a, an addition uh, to this, uh, the, what is essentially the back of the north side of the library. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, the addition was proposed by the town uh, for, for, for three primary purposes. One is to provide full accessibility to the library. Um, the library is currently not accessible. Uh, the only entry at the south side, uh, which is the opposite side of, of the building from this, uh, has a, a set of steps, about seven risers that go up to it. Um, uh, uh, so the, the new addition will provide full accessibility. Uh, it will also provide uh, a new meeting room and uh, fully accessible bathrooms uh, for the public, for library functions and community functions. And also uh, uh, um, part of the project is to upgrade the, the systems uh, in the existing library, as well as provide uh, new systems for the, for the addition. Uh, those include new mechanical systems, uh, new fire alarm uh, for, the, for the existing library, new, new LED, uh, uh, energy efficient lighting uh, and some other some other uh, uh, minor minor improvements. So, in order to make the connection to the uh, proposed addition, uh, we are proposing removal of a section of wall. It's about um, 15 feet by 15 feet, um, uh, and that's that's this section here that's outlined in red. Uh, it is mostly siding. Uh, there is a little bit of foundation wall at the bottom uh, and a couple of transom windows uh, and some trim at the top. Um, the intention here uh, uh, is to remove really the, the minimal amount of, of historic fabric so that we can make this connection to the new, to the new entry. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, to the new addition. Um, as part of the, uh, this connection, uh, with the proposed addition, uh, the chimney, uh, which you can see here above the roof line, that goes all the way down inside the framing of the building, all the way down to the basement. Uh, there is an existing fireplace in the library on the inside. And in order to make the, the physical connection um, uh, through this wall up to uh, the, the existing library level, that chimney and fireplace will have to be removed as well. So. Uh, it doesn't, the, the chimney doesn't have a, a huge presence on the outside, but obviously there is a presence here above the roof. Um, the intention is that that chimney would be removed and um, the, uh, there would be replacement slates uh, 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 to patch the, the, the hole in, in, in the roof. Um, we, we've tried to, uh, um, to have the new, the proposed addition connect in as small an area as possible. Uh, we wanted to preserve all of the, uh, the primary windows in the building. Uh, we wanted to be able to have the, uh, the corners uh, of the building um, uh, be unencumbered by any, any new architecture. Uh, and so we've really tried to keep it to a minimum. And this space will allow for a wheelchair lift uh, a new stairway going up to the library level uh, from the new, uh, ent uh, the new uh, entry, which will be in the addition, and a new stairway going down to the basement for staff use. 
Um, so this is a uh, 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 um, color uh, elevations. This is the front of the library here on the right. You can see that there is a set uh, about a half a flight of steps uh, going up to the building. Um, we chose to, uh, to look at uh, an addition off the back of the building so that we could preserve the front of the building uh, without having to look at putting any sort of a ramp or a lift or something. Uh, the building is highly symmetrical. Um, any sort of an addition like a, a ramp or, or a lift we thought would really compromise uh, this, this primary facade, this entry facade, uh, which is why we've, we've um, uh, looked on the, uh, to the back to, to put the addition. Um, let's see here. Uh, the building was uh, 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 built in uh, 1893. Uh, the architect was Roswell Field Putnam. Uh, he was a, a well-known architect at the time uh, and designed quite a few library buildings as well as uh, many residences in Northampton and Amherst. Um, uh, that's, I think that's really pretty much it. Um, in a, uh, 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 I think I'm going to leave my presentation there. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, is uh, if town staff have any additional information about this project that you would like to share. Yeah, I think um, Chris did a good overview, a great overview of the uh, demolition proposal. Um, my understanding is, you know, it's the chimney being removed and the back wall section as described, and that's to enable the um, attachment of the addition to the library. Um, this has been, the addition has been reviewed by the design review board. And I believe the addition is also pending site plan review or is soon to be reviewed uh, by the planning board and site plan review. Um, the Let's see, the other, um, you know, 1893, that's when the library was constructed, to my knowledge. Um, the, in the uh, listing on the State Register of Historic Places, it's recognized as possibly the first free library in Amherst, um, as the Library Association was developed in 1869, so quite a bit beforehand. Um, and another kind of like historical uh, consideration is that uh, the North Amherst Library is a contrib contributing structure to the uh, North Amherst Center uh, National Historic District. So just for your knowledge as well. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, are there questions from members of the Historical Commission? Um, Raman. Um, I just had a question. Um, can, ben, can you refresh my memory about, or, and or Jane about, um, I know that I'm guessing that there, when did the Secretary of the, of the Interior's standards come into play? That's one thing I'm just not, I don't know. If, uh, I know it's a thing and I don't know what role it has. Um, hmm. I think this current version, I believe is 1990-ish. I might be wrong about that, but I think it's about that old. Um, perhaps the question is, maybe a question is whether this project uh, needs to be reviewed by the State Historical Commission. Yeah, I think that I'm just trying to understand it, if that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, we uh, we are in the in the process of submitting a, a PNF or project notification form uh, to Mass Historic for the project. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I will say um, I think a a separate conversation might need to happen with the historical commission regarding our you know support for the project overall. Um, it, as I think the state historic 
commission would look to us as a, for as the local historic commission for that request. Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. Um, Hetty, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Chris. I just wanted to ask you about um, the possible significance of the fireplace. And if you could talk a little bit more about um, how that's being handled in relation to the wall coming down. Um, sure. So, um, Ed, well, as I said, the, the, you know, the, the fireplace and, and except for the chimney above the roof, um, all the rest of that masonry is on the inside of the building. Um, there is, uh, I, am not sure if you've been to the, to the library recently. Um, it's, it's quite a small space. It's, it's only about, uh, 850 square feet, uh, the, uh, a footprint. Um, and, and right now the library does have some, some uh, materials displayed in front of the fireplace. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I, I haven't actually seen the, uh, the firebox, uh, but there is, um, uh, there is some uh, uh, woodwork uh, above the firebox, above the mantle, uh, that matches the interior of the rest of the room. And I think our intention is that the fireplace proper, the masonry portion of the fireplace, uh, will simply be removed. Uh, but but we would like to uh, to salvage some of that interior woodwork uh, to finish off the new opening uh, that goes into the uh, into the addition um, to 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 try to preserve as much of that uh, existing uh, detail and woodwork as possible. So. That's our that's our intention of how to how to handle that. Um, Chris, I have a question uh, just for clarification that the the gable on the north side is not it, that remains that's not part of the demolition request. That's exactly right. Uh, the, the the gable uh, the dormer will remain. It is just the, 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 the chimney above the roof, which, which isn't shown here, um, that will be removed uh, and this section of wall be, between the windows. Uh, so uh, e everything else you see here in this, in this colored elevation uh, will remain. Thank you. Um, Jan. I just would like to say that as your rep on the design review board, I did see the full presentation of the addition along with this. And even though it was a little painful to think about losing the fireplace, the addition is so um, appropriate to the space, matches this building, um, fits so nicely from ground level up into this and back, adds you know, all the things that this library lacks. And I think that um, there really way to connect to this building without turning something more significant to the architectural form. So um, as much as I hate touching any of these uh, Victorian buildings, I think that this their solution was the best that um, could happen. And we gave them some suggestions about some of the details that we wanted them to rethink. And Chris has been really open about that um, and is planning to do so. Um, and I, I just want to say that in spite of how we might, you know, be concerned about hurting this building, I really think in this particular case, it will be for the best. Well, th thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Um, Hetty, your hand is, is up, but that may be a holdover. Oh, okay. Um, uh, are there any other questions or comments from commission members? All right, then, uh, then we will open this to public comment. If there are members of the public, I see um, a hand from Meg Gage. 
Hey, uh, Meg, you should be able to unmute and- I unmuted, thank you. Uh, there I am. <laughs> I, uh, and this is Meg Gage. I live at 208 Montague Road, uh, about a half a mile down from the library. Uh, I'm thrilled by this plan and everyone I know is as well. Um, there are always compromises. The fireplace, for example, the trees that were lost, the two trees, although we'll replant some. Uh, I, I speak for myself, but also uh, the District One Neighborhood Association has had a public uh, conversation about this and everyone was enthusiastic. There wasn't one single uh, critical comment made we think the design that uh, Chris, that Kuhn Riddle did was brilliant in that it keeps the Queen Anne style. Uh, it's interesting, the idea to not change the front, I had thought, well, we'll just put a ramp up, but um, I think the design that you all came up with is much better. Um, this is a really key part of our village center. Uh, it's part of our historic, National Historic District. A lot of our kids learn to read in this library. Uh, and uh, it's been a really important part of our neighborhood and I can't speak, I guess I could keep going on and on, but <laughs> I won't, Enthusi I'm very enthusiastic about it. But more important, everyone I know around here is enthusiastic about it. And we hope um, people in town will think of getting their books picked up here because it's such a convenient place to drive to. Anyway, a total appreciation of uh, the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other comments? All right then, uh, seeing none, um, uh, I'll add, invite uh, Chris Farley to make any further observations he, he would like to. Uh, I, I just want to say I, I very much appreciate um, all the comments uh, about the addition. Uh, we do feel like it's um, in, in particular how it how the new addition attaches to the existing building um, is is uh, pretty sensitively done, so it's it's really nice to have uh, that affirmation from uh, uh, from board members and from the public. So thank you for that. Thank you. And then, are there any final uh, comments or questions from members of the commission or from uh, town staff? And then. Um, so we uh, may now close the public hearing and turn to um, commission deliberations. Uh, so the public hearing is now closed and perhaps we could begin by, I'm sorry, my cat is meowing in the background. Um, uh, asking for a motion and uh, Jan. I was just about to say, I think we need a motion. Um, I move that we close the public hearing. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Robin. Um, let's see, because we're on Zoom, I think we will do this as a roll call. Um, all in favor, uh, Patricia off. In favor. Thank you, Robin Fordham. In favor. Uh, Jan Marquardt? Yes. Uh, Hetty, start up. Yes. And Jane Wald, I, I agree. Yes. Um, all right. Um, now uh, we'll need to turn to reviewing the standards for designation as a significant structure as enumerated in section 13.4 of the zoning bylaw uh, for uh, information uh, for uh, members of the public who are uh, listening in, uh, meeting only one of the criteria is sufficient for designation as a significant structure. Uh, and then from that point, the commission uh, deliberates on uh, the 
appropriateness or not of um, uh, approving the, the demolition permit or, um, or, or not. Um, so perhaps we could start that with a, with a motion. Um, Robin? Uh, I was gonna ask if the um, standards could be placed on the screen. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's a good idea. I, I guess I move to begin discussion of the standards. Or you could move, you could move to, um, yeah. What is, is that, yeah. is that the no, appropriate we'll, we'll do it, we'll do, tell you what, I, maybe I've got this out of order. We'll, do, we'll go through the standards and then we'll have a motion about what to, what to do about the, uh, the demolition application. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Um, okay, um, so uh, the first criterion is that the property, uh, is it listed? on or is it within an area listed on the National Register of Historic Places or is the subject of a pending application for listing on said register? And we understand already that yes, it is a contributing structure in a National Register district. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy just to show everyone briefly. Uh, this is the National Register district for the, or uh, what is it called? The, for the um, listing of the North Amherst Center Historic District. And you can see here the North Amherst Library is listed under, under it here. Go back here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, next, the commission determines that the structure meets one or more of the following criteria of historical, architectural, or geographic importance. And we'll take uh, subheads uh, from each of these three uh, general categories. So for historical importance, uh, the structure meets the criteria of historical importance if it uh, first has character, interest, or value as part of the development, heritage, or cultural characteristics of the town of Amherst, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or the nation. And we can uh, discuss, or we can just go right to uh, right to a, um, a vote for each of these. So why don't we go right to a vote? Vote, um, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, Pat? Um, yes. Okay, uh, Robin? Yes. Uh, Jan? Yes. Hetty? Yes. And I agree, yes. Okay, uh, next, uh, is, this, is it the site of an historic event? And um, Pat? I think it's a historic building, but not necessarily known events. Okay, um, Robin? No. Jan? Uh, not as far as we know at this point. Okay. Hetty? Agreed with Jan, not as far as we know. Okay. And um, I agree. Uh, we don't know that it is. Um, uh, next, uh, is it identified with a person or group of persons who had some influence on society? And Pat? I don't know that we know that. Okay. Um, Robin? No, not to our knowledge. Jan? I imagine some of our famous writers that'll be on the writer's walk probably went in there, may have written there, but we don't have any stories that specifically connect this building. So I would say no. Okay. Uh, Hetty? No, not at this time. Okay. And I, I agree that we don't know, so I'm gonna say no. Um, last, uh, in historical importance is whether the building exemplifies the cultural, political, economic, social, or historic heritage of the community. And this time, I'll give Pat a break and we'll ask Hetty to begin. Yes. Um, uh, Jan? Uh, yes, okay. I think. 
Yes. No. Robin? Yes. And Pat? Yes. And um, I, I agree. I think it is uh, very significant in that respect, and uh, especially the cultural heritage of the community. Um, next, there are four criteria under architectural importance. Um, first, does it portray the environment of a group of people in an era of history characterized by a distinctive architectural style? Um, Hetty? Yes. Uh, Jan? Sorry, I'm trying to take notes and then also- Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, um, yes, I think it does, the Victorian style. Okay, uh, Robin? Yes. Uh, Pat? Yes. And uh, I vote yes also. Uh, does it embody those distinguishing characteristics of an architectural type? And Pat? Yes. Um, Robin? Yes. Jan? Yes. Uh, Hetty? Yes. And I vote yes also. Um, is it the work of an architect, master builder, or craftsman whose individual work has influenced the development of the town? I'm gonna to start this time. I say yes. Um, let's see, Hetty? Yes. Uh, Jan? Well, I'm not entirely sure that it influenced the town. Um, maybe if it was the first neo-medieval building in town, but certainly having a library by somebody who was famous for building libraries, maybe. Um, I, we don't really need to say yes, because we're saying yes and everything else, but um, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to say no. OK. And OK, I've lost track. Robin, uh, I already uh, ask you. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm also going to say no. Okay. And Pat. I would say no. It's a, a master architect, but I'm not sure other than develop the development of the North Amherst Center that it had influence otherwise. So the way I, I just to explain my uh, vote, I, I read this as, um, is it the work of an architect whose individual work influenced the development of the town? And I think uh, Roswell Putnam uh, was the architect for a great many uh, buildings of this period. So that's, um, that's uh, why I think he, he's influenced the town. But. Um, okay, uh, and finally for architectural importance, uh, does, does this building contain elements of architectural design, detail, materials, or craftsmanship, uh, which represents a significant innovation? And Pat, I'll start with you. I think not. Okay. Uh, Robin? No. Jan? No, I don't think so. It was typical of the period. Hetty? No, it's very typical. And I agree uh, and vote no. Um, finally, uh, is uh, geographic importance. The structure meets the criteria of geographic importance if the site is part of or related to a square, park, or other distinctive area. Um, and I'll, again, uh, maybe I'll work from the middle this time. Jan? Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's distinctive on that V in the middle of North Amherst. Um, okay. I, even, I mean, it's not a square or a park, but it is um, a significant corner in the road. Um, I'd say yes. Okay. Um, Hetty? I think I, I'm going to say yes, too. Okay. 
Uh, Robin. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Pat. Yes. And yes, I agree. Yes. Um, and then finally, the structure as to its unique location or its physical characteristics represents an established and familiar visual feature of the neighborhood, village center, or the community as a whole. And Pat, would you begin? Uh, yes. Okay. And Robin? Yes. Jan? Absolutely. Um, Hetty? Yes, especially from the front. Okay, thank you. And yes, I, uh, I agree. Um, so uh, we have uh, voted affirmatively on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven criteria. Um, so I believe we've established that uh, this is a significant structure. Uh, and we now um, now it's time to deliberate on uh, whether it uh, it's whether the suggested demolition uh, would have uh, a detrimental impact on public interest. I'll invite any any comments about that. Um, Jan. Well, I'll just repeat what I said before. I think that um, the demolition is minor. It is tastefully um, set within the connection to the addition. I don't think it would be detrimental at all to the current building and certainly using that to um, connect to the new building will be uh, beneficial. Um, so I would say no, it, it won't be de uh, detrimental and should be approved, the application. Okay. Um, Pat. Um, I agree with Jan. I think it would actually be an enhancement of the building and its use on the historic site without disrupting its historic architecture or place in history. You and Robin. Uh, I'm in agreement with both Jan and Pat. Okay. Um, uh, would someone like to make a motion about how we should uh, uh, treat the um, application for a demolition permit? And I see Jan's hand. I move that we approve the application for demolition of the fireplace and chimney in the north wall of the North Library in order to allow penetration of the building um, for a connection to the addition being built to the north. Dot, dot, dot. I have to write this down, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, or, uh, we'll speak slowly for a while. <laughs> and uh, Pat. I second that motion. Okay, thank you. And uh, would you like a moment, Jan? Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, um, great. So now uh, we'll just proceed with uh, a roll call vote on the motion that's been seconded. Uh, oh, yes, I need to ask if there's any further discussion. All right, then um, let's, let's go to a vote. Um, Pat, would you cast your vote? I agree. Okay. Um, Robin. I agree. Jan? Yes. 
Hetty? Yes. And I vote yes. So uh, the outcome of this vote is that uh, the motion is approved, meaning the building is a significant structure, but proposed demolition would not be det detrimental to the, uh, the, the demolition that is proposed would not be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage or resources of the town. So the demolition permit will be approved and um, Ben, would you like to um, convey anything about how that happens? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the Historical Commission will provide guidance to the building commissioner to approve the demolition, you know, as long as all the other uh, health, health and building codes are met, which I'm sure they are. Um, the, we will also transmit our decision to the planning board um, to let them know that Historical has already reviewed this and that it's in their purview to approve, approve the site plan review. Um, so I will look out for an email. I'll transmit the result of this uh, to Rob Moore, the building commissioner, and to Chris Brestrup, planning director. And um, yeah, look forward to you know, seeing the project move forward. And if in the future there's anything you need from us in your uh, discussions with state or mass historic, uh, certainly let us know. We'd be happy to help. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and thank you for the decision. Uh, very much appreciated. Okay. Thank, thank you for uh, bringing this to us, Chris. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see, now let's uh, go to the second demolition permit request. Um, the public hearing is now open for uh, 37 North Pleasant Street. This is map 14A, parcel 49, owned by Barry Roberts. And it's a, a request for the full demolition of uh, a turn of the 20th century wood frame, two-story commercial building. Um, so uh, welcome, Barry and Tom, and if you would um, please, uh, uh, you're free to present any, any information you would like to. I think I'm gonna let Tom do the presenting. I'm happy to answer any questions. He's a much better public speaker than I am. So Tom, that's up to you. Might be having technical difficulties. I see a blank screen. Um, I wonder, is it possible to? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I have to resort to the Google laptop. Oops. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Perfect. we can now. It was it, it, it frozen for a second there, but. Okay. Uh, let me do that. Perfect. So, um, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, hi, Ben. You've been doing a great job. Uh, I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, here on behalf of 37 North Pleasant Street LLC, owned by Barry Roberts, uh, in this demolition delay. Um, application, hopefully to get it waived. And so I think you've, um, you're probably familiar with the site. Uh, currently McMurphy's Amherst typewriter, as well as the former Boys and Girls Club, and even more formally, the, the Knights of Columbus. I think you had put together that PowerPoint presentation, which is excellent. Um, it is uh, an old structure, uh, but, but I think our contention would be it is not significant um, historically, architecturally, or geographically. I think Jonathan Tucker did a really wonderful job of pulling together some of the folks who had um, um, used it, whether it was their businesses, I think is what you saw. Uh, but it didn't seem like any of those folks, with all due respect to them, um, were individually important. And so, you know, what we're asking for obviously is for the, the right to take down 
uh, that building, those buildings. And I think, you know, Barry's been in the buildings. We've been in the buildings. Um, they're not in the best state of repair. Uh, and, and they've probably seen the end of, of their useful life. And Barry, I don't know if you want to add anything to just the state of repair of those buildings. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. I actually uh, was on a second floor of the bank building uh, yesterday looking over and you can see what a sway back the roof is and the south wall is really a uh, bowed out but I just think the building is functionally obsolescent I think it's you know time to uh, get a new building there yeah and so I mean what we would be looking for is you know as the chairwoman noted a, a complete demolition of um, those buildings so on Unfortunately, unlike the North Amherst Library where they were just taken down a piece, we would be looking for the complete demolition of those buildings. Obviously happy to answer any questions that you have, um, but I think that's, it, it's, it's a pretty simple presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, do you uh, have other information you'd like to share? We appreciate your supplementing what, we, um, what we've already received but is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I would just add a few notes, um, fill in the gaps. I'll, I'll go ahead and just share this PowerPoint. Um, and all the panelists have seen this, but for the benefit of the members of the public uh, today. So the buildings in question, um, I will note it's 37 North Pleasant is McMurphy's, but I believe Amherst Typewriter is also included in this. Uh, proposal, so that's at 41 North Pleasant, but um, so we're referring to this building in red here um, that fronts North Pleasant Street. The uh, building currently is home to McMurphy's and the Amherst typewriter. Um, and I just, uh, I, I was able to collect historical imagery um, of that shows the building um, going back to 1887, I believe. Um, and, you know, I think my, you know, I, I did, I dug through the tax records, I dug through the deeds and everything I could, um, that was available to me to try to figure out exactly when various architectural features were replaced or repaired or, you know, trying to understand what's original and what's not. Um, I didn't get very far. There's not, you know, it's hard to document every window and every door and every facade and every little bits and pieces being replaced. But I think, you know, it's easy to see it's vinyl, you know, and it's vinyl siding. The windows are, you know, modernized. So it's not or original at this point. Um, and I'll just take you on a brief little slideshow. Um, this is from Jones Library Special Collections. Um, you can see the uh, Knights of Columbus building here uh, along the uh, North Pleasant Street. Um, similar, a little bit later, 1895. Uh, 1910, you see the uh, two-story building next door up here. Uh, you know, those two windows are very distinct. Um, and, you know, it's interesting with these pictures, you can see the change in technology. You see the automobile come to Amherst um, with these buildings still intact. You see el elm trees lining the street, which we don't have anymore. Uh, this is an aerial uh, from 1946, so mid-century. And you zoom in and you can, you know, to the right here, you can see the buildings. And it looked like that by then the third building had been uh, built you know, Judy's restaurant wasn't there at this point. Um, and I believe that came later on in the century. Uh, McMurphy's, what's now McMurphy's used to have house a restaurant, the colonial restaurant, um, mid century. And there was where the typewriter store is, was a uh, shoe, shoe cobbler. Um, and, you know, you can see here they're, I guess they're tearing up the trolley lines another you know change in technology uh and uh you can see the buildings here 1961 same thing same day 1961 uh 
you can see Barcelotti's is a was a longtime Amherst establishment, I believe, uh, from 1933 to early 2000s. Uh, a bar was located here, and that since uh, was kind of added to the Judy's restaurant. So that that doesn't exist anymore in its current in its old form. Um, so it's really you know this building from here to here that we're referring to. Uh, yeah, that's what I mentioned here. So Judy's kind of, well, well, I'm using the word annexed the building, kind of in, incorporated into their facade. Um, and yeah, lastly, I mentioned this uh, because uh, the building um, is not located, is not a contributing structure to the Central Amherst or Amherst Central Business District National Register of historic places. Um, if you read through the entry for the Amherst Central Business District, uh, it talks about the northernmost building in the district, stands just south of the alley that leads to the parking area behind Main Street. So that's kind of the alleyway that goes next to Antonio's. Uh, you know, built in 1880, uh, that's referring to the building where Antonio's is, is a single story, one room deep Victorian vernacular commercial building. Um, so, uh, the, uh, it seems the Amherst Central Business District kind of incorporates a lot of the three-story, you know, in some cases, four-story brick buildings that line Amity Street, Main Street, South Pleasant, North Pleasant Street, but it stops short of um, incorporating the buildings at 37 and 41 North Pleasant Street. So um, that's all I have. I think um, I'll just show briefly the historic aerial maps. These were the Sanborn fire maps that are provided by the Library of Congress um, and were done for like fi fire insurance rates. Uh, and so in red, you can see the evolution of the building. Uh, and this one, sorry, is from 1887, uh, a bakery was built. Uh, we believe that's the uh, Knights of Columbus building at 37 North Pleasant Street. And uh, kind of just watch it closely. In 1890, 1896, an, oven, an exterior oven was attached to the building. And then as you move along, 1902, it looks like a plumber and a tin shop uh, pop up next door. That is in the same location as 41 North Pleasant Street where the typewriter store is. And then you can see in, you know, 1910, kind of the, uh, a, a little, small little business uh, is added, a wallpaper business um, where, you know, I'm not sure, somehow that was incorporated into the, uh, into the facade as well. So uh, just giving you an idea of kind of how these buildings were originally used in the early 1900s and um, their evolution over time. So um, that's the information I have. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I dug through, yeah, special collections at Jones Library, uh, historical tax records, the deeds, um, historic maps, and that's kind of what, what I came up with for historical narrative and research. Okay, thank, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, now it is time for questions from commission members. I have one for, uh, I'm not sure who it's for, for Ben or for Barry or Tom. Um, I think in the slideshow, Ben, it, uh, Barcelotti's was identified as 39 North Pleasant, but that's to the north of the typewriter store, which is 40, now 41, which is adjacent to 37. So I'm wondering yeah. what, yeah, just about the, the numbering. It. Barry, I don't know if you know the answer to that. You pay the taxes, know. so, okay. Sorry. Um... It might have some things might have changed when Barcelotti's was kind of added into the Judy's building, because uh, obviously that address ceased to exist. 
Um, but I agree. I mean, there is an odd gap between 37 and 41. Um, and then the second question is, um, is that oven still around? <laughs> I don't think so, but Barry, I'll, I'll defer to you. I, I, in, in my travels there, I haven't ever seen that oven. No, it was, it was on the Northeast corner. And I, uh, I don't recall seeing that ever. I was just Googling Amherst typewriter while you were talking, I'm sorry. And uh, it says 41, so. Hmm. I've seen no uh, evidence of the uh, oven any of the time that I've been there. Any other questions, comments? Okay, then um, let's go to uh, public comment. Uh, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to wants to make a comment, um, and I'm just going to sort of give a reminder that um, the comments should focus on the historical value of the structure, which is the historical commission's exclusive purview under the current bylaw, and not on prospective plans for uh, development, which under the current bylaw are excluded from historical commission deliberations. Um, so uh, if there is a comment, uh, please tell us your name and address. Um, and, uh, and then we will proceed. So I see uh, Meg Gage. Hi, Meg Gage again, here I am. <laughs> um, I'm not opposed to this demolition at all. I have a lot of confidence in Barry's uh, judgment and uh, we were partners in saving the Amherst Cinema. Um, and, so, and it's clearly a building that's pretty run down. This is related to historic um, preservation, but it's one of the, the Amherst typewriter is one of the very few businesses in town owned by an African-American. And I regret that I hope we're gonna find ways down the road to empower more people of color to own businesses in our downtown. But I have total confidence in Barry's decisions and uh, his commitment to our community. Thank you. Are there are other uh, comments from members of the public. All right, then. Um, uh, Tom or Barry, anything else that you want to share with us? I don't think so. Just again, thanks to Ben for, I mean, he did an incredible amount of work. So it was, it was excellent. Thanks a lot. And Jonathan did a good job researching too. Yeah. 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 Uh, then final comments or questions from members of the commission or town staff. I just would be interested in the expansion of the comments about the state of the building with the bowed wall and the sagging roof um, and how that affects the structural integrity of the building. How does it affect it? It's, it's uh, obviously a sign of foundation weakness over the years um, because it's allowed the wall to bolt uh, bow out towards the south, which then would make the roof rafters come down so that I make them sag. So the wall goes out, the rafters come down, and that makes causes the sagging. So which it, it, it indicates a problem with the foundation as well. Yes. Thank you. And the foundation under the buildings is a mishmash of different, you know, cinder block and stone and you know, it's not like it's a poured concrete foundation. It's been cobbled up over the years, I would say. Thank you. All right then. Um, so now we will close the public hearing and proceed to uh, reviewing the standards for designation as a significant structure. Uh, those that are listed in section 13.4 of the zoning bylaw 
Um, and again, meeting only one of the criteria is sufficient for designation as a significant structure, but uh, uh, the commission continues its deliberation after that. So um, I see Jan's hand. Uh, I move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? And I'm not- I, I second. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's see, uh, well, let's go to a vote for that on that motion. And it uh, will begin with uh, Pat. Agree. Uh, Robin. Agree. Uh, Jan. Yes. Hetty. Yes. And I too vote yes. So that's uh, unanimous, the public hearing is closed. Uh, and thank you, Ben, for putting up the, um, the standards for designation as a significant structure. Um, so we'll uh, move through these again. Um, we've already heard that it, uh, the structure is not a part uh, of a district or uh, is not listed individually on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, uh, for historical importance, um, does this structure have character, interest, or value as part of the development, heritage, or cultural characteristics of the town of Amherst, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or the nation? Um, and I will ask uh, Hetty. Yes. And then um, Jan? Well, Development, heritage, or cultural characteristics. Perhaps. Um, come back to me. I need to think further, and I was taking notes. Okay. Um, Robin? I'm mute, Robin. I'm going to say no. Pat? I'm going to say no. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say no. And then I'm going to go back to Jan. I don't think so. Okay. I would have to say no. All right. Um, is, this, is this the site of an historic event? And I'll begin with um, Pat. No. Then Robin? No. Jan? No. Hetty? No, not that we know of. And I agree, no. Um, is it identified with a person or group of persons who had some influence on society? Um, and uh, Pat? I would say no, excepting the Knights of Columbus, but that wasn't associated with the building. Um, so I, I'm gonna say no. Okay. Uh, Robin. Uh, no. Jan. Um, not that I know of. Hetty. No. And I'll say no. Um, does it exemplify the cultural, political, economic, social, or historic heritage of the community? Um, Hetty. Yes. And um, Jan. Political, cultural, economic, socialism. Exemplifies cultural, economic. I mean, there were bars. That's pretty cultural in Amherst. Um, <laughs> economic, that size and shape of building along that street in the late 19th century. It's not really historic heritage because they aren't well, they aren't architecturally historically significant, but that is part of the history of so I guess it's, yeah. did, did you complete your vote? I think there was a little interruption. Oh, sorry. I said, I guess I'd say yes after I oh, finished. Okay. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry. I'm, just, I'm trying to do too much at once here. Sorry. Um, Robin? Um, 
I feel like I'm leaning no for the reason that I don't think without that that its physical presence presents that in its current state. So I'm gonna say no. Okay, um, Pat. Um, for much the same reason as Robin, um, I, I don't think it has a strong influence historically, the property itself. Okay, uh, and I'm going to agree with Robin about the emphasis on the word exemplifies because it just does not seem to do that right now. So uh, we've ended it. We've ended at no on on that criterion. Um, architectural importance. Does it portray the environment of a group of people in an era of history uh, characterized by a distinctive architectural style? Um, and Pat. I, I would say no, it's a vernacular architecture that's changed consistently over the years. Robin? Um, can I pass for the time being? Yes, uh, Jan. Well, um, not really. No, I mean, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, Hetty. No, I don't think so. Um, and I agree. I do not think it is a distinctive architectural style. Um, and let's see, Robin. Uh, yeah, I will agree, no. Okay. Um, does it embody uh, those distinguishing characteristics of an architectural type? Um, uh, Hetty. No, difficult. Um, no, really. Um, Jan? Well, if the distinctive architectural type is bland, <laughs> I would say not really, not, not the way I've studied architecture. Uh, Robin? No. And Pat? No. And I, I agree, no. Um, is this the work of an architect, master builder, or craftsman whose individual work has influenced the development of the town? Uh, and uh, Pat? No. Uh, Robin? No. Hetty? No. Jan? I hope not. No. No. Okay. <laughs> no, no, and no. Um, let's see. Does it uh, contain elements of architectural design, detail, materials, or craft craftsmanship, which represents a significant innovation? Uh, Pat? No. Robin? Jan? No. Hetty? No. I say no. Um, geographic importance. Uh, the structure meets the criteria of geograph geographic importance if the site is part of or related to a square, park, or other distinctive area. Um, Hetty, how, how do you say? Oh, this is tricky. You know, I think the answer is no. Boy, is that site close to probably the most important intersection in downtown Amherst. Um, uh, Janet. Oi, oi, oi. Um, no, I think the next one is more appropriate than this one. So I'll say no on this. Okay. Robin? Uh, no. Pat? No. And I say no as well. Um, the structure as, it's, as to its unique location or its physical characteristics represents an established and familiar visual feature of the neighborhood, village center, or the community as a whole. Um, Pat. This is a tough one. Um, I would say no, only in that it's facade has changed over the years. Its role and usage has changed over the years. It's unlike a building like compared to the North Library. It's, you know, it's 
architecturally important, physically important to the village center. Um, this doesn't seem to have held that role in its history. So I, I'm going to say no. Okay, thank you. Um, Robin. Uh, I am also going to say no that it's, um, I don't think its location is unique or its physical characteristics meet, meet that standard. Um, Jan. Well, I think that those bland two-story um, fill-in structures along main streets in towns are pretty established and familiar features of 20th century small town America. And physically, I think it is familiar even though it's been recited and that um, the bar, the typewriter shop, it's just a typical um, type of building, but it's something that has been seen along that street for over a hundred years. So I have to say yes. Okay. Um, Hetty. Um, I say yes as well. I think if you look at the historical information that has been provided along with the, the um, Sanborn maps, what we're actually looking at is an imprint of something incredibly typical and incredibly characteristic of many small college towns in the northeast of the country. And while the physical fabric of the building doesn't express all those at a uniform level of quality, um, what we have here is something um, that is uh, very much the character of, of a, a small town like Amherst. Um, and all of the people who've lived and worked and adapted and changed and innovated in this, in this area have, have, uh, have stories that are valuable, um, have work that is valuable, have <laughs> entrepreneurship that is valuable. And I just, I just think that um, I would have to vote yes on this particular standard. Okay, this is a this is a tough one. I um, uh, I'm going to vote no because um, I don't think its specific location is unique in a way that gives it essential character. Um, Uh, and I, you know, I wrestle with the last um, clause of this, um, that it's an established and familiar visual feature of the neighborhood. I, I think it is a feature of the neighborhood, but I think it's undistinguished. So I, I'm going to vote no. Um, and as I look, sort of tally up uh, our, um, our votes on these various criteria, um, we have not, uh, it has not met any one of the criteria based on our votes. So, um, so we apparently have found that the building is not a significant structure. Uh, for purposes of the bylaw, and that uh, that means that the demolition permit can go forward. And I don't believe we need a motion on that, do we? I think we need a motion just to uh, you know close deliberation and you know uh, if, you know op make an opportunity for any additional comments um, from the commission members or the applicant. So I make a motion that we close deliberation and move on to further comments and completion of the hearing. If that, if you think that's necessary, then um, I don't think we did it in for uh, the prior hearing, um, but I don't 
I don't object to hearing that motion. And is there a second? Second. Thank you. And let's see, um, any discussion? Then um, Pat, would you vote please? Um, I agree. Right, and Robin? Agree. Jan? Um, yes, I just, at some point I would like to ask whether anyone from the public listening, um, for instance, Scott Mertzbach, um, to raise the entire there would only be to delay demolition. We cannot stop it. And I just need people to know that. Um, and then I vote yes to close deliberation. Um, Hetty? I vote to close the deliberation. And uh, I vote yes to close deliberation. All right. Um, so that is the outcome. And Ben, would you like to say anything about process at this point? Yep. Um, so the similar to before, um, you know, as long as the building commissioner finds that all, you know, health and building codes are met, uh, then the, uh, the historical commission will provide an opinion that, you know, we've reviewed the application and the application can uh, move forward uh, with our approval. So I will transmit that information to Rob Mora, building commissioner, and we'll also, you know, CC you on any correspondence regarding this application. And, uh, you know, I think you, you you guys are experienced with development in Amherst. I'm sure there's, you know, utility sign offs and other forms you have to fill out for demolition. But um, as far as historical is concerned, this can move forward. Perfect. Thanks uh, for your efforts and to the commission for, for their efforts in, in discussion and deliberation. We appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you thanks. very much. Thank you. thank you for bringing this to us and good luck. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we can move into the agenda for the public meeting. Um, I'm going to, uh, because we have, we, uh, we do have guests here for um, the Mill River um, agenda item. Um, I'm just going to move that up and we can um, yeah. manage announcements a little bit later. Yeah, and I was going to say if uh, if Robin needs to go, <laughs> I was going to stay for the Mill River. Okay, gotcha. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so I can invite uh, here. Yeah, I can bring in Meg. Meg Reed. Uh, so we've, um, we've discussed the District 1 Neighborhood Association's um, proposed project for Mill River uh, in prior meetings, um, and it's gone to uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee and um, has come back. Um, so... Um, Could you turn the radio off here? <laughs> So um, maybe first, I don't know, Robin, would you, is, would you like to uh, sort of give us a little, a little information about what's happened with the CPA portion, uh, a deliberation about this? Yeah, so at the last meeting uh, of the CPAC, we were going over um, trying to understand what's eligible under the CPA and in what categories so that we on the historical commission and on the CPAC can, um, and you know, the town primarily can have a clear sense of what's eligible and what's not. And in the, the my process of looking at documents, um, I was referencing a Department of Revenue guidance on the um, Community Preservation Act and what's eligible and what's not. The first question for the CPAC was, 
whether the language that we have in there was inaccurate and suggested that certain plans and surveys were eligible when they weren't. Um, and in the Department of Revenue guidance, those items fall under administrative expenses. And they're pretty clear about um, historic preservation projects being physical projects, but that surveys and plans can be paid for under administration if they relate to a project that's before the committee. That's it was at least my read of it. But at the meeting, I said that this is getting to the point where, you know, these are the documents that we have and we really need the town staff to clarify for us. Um, you know, if this read is an accurate representation. Um, at the same time, I did let Meg know that that was how I was looking at this. I don't know how it can unfold, but it seemed like an appropriate project to have a survey performed under administration if, if the town and the CPAC so allowed in anticipation of a specific preservation project around the remnants of the buildings um, in that area, but nothing archeological and nothing interpretive. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, do you have comments that you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I think Robin covered it. I mean, I, I've honestly, I haven't had much correspondence with the CPA committee nor Town, any other town staff uh, for a while now about this project, but I think um, and I'm also a little bit confused about, I know the town council approved CPA funding last week. Um, and so I, I'm not sure how this fits in with the current round of funding or whether we're thinking about next year. Okay. Um, Robin, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, ben, I was in the middle of crafting an email to you, but I didn't finish it. I wanted to send you all the documents that I referenced okay. in that meeting. So I can get that to you. I thought that the Mill River project was not voted on, therefore it did not go before town council. So I think that in conversations that we've had in CPAC, it wasn't I mean, we have entertained town projects out of cycle, so oh, right. it seems like it would be possible that we, you know, there's no, there's not a, um, I mean, there's some, I, I would say there's not urgency um, in, in the strictest sense of the word. So as we unpack how projects like this can be presented to CPAC and be funded, um, I figured we would have this discussion here and I'd get you those materials and then maybe we could pick it up next week. I mean, next month. Yep. Um, Meg, would you, uh, would you like to share uh, other development, recent developments from Dona and its application or strategy or... Um, Whoops, I think you're still muted. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm really grateful to Robin and Jane for trying to figure out and Ben how to make this work. Um, uh, there's not much, we're very eager to do this project uh, and we've reduced it now to just the, really the survey of the sites as described. I wrote a <clears throat> a new one page summary proposal that we can send to everybody, but um, we're just waiting to hear what's possible and uh, extremely appreciative of particularly Robin and Jane's efforts to try to figure out how to make this work. You know, whatever, if, you know, it's not, we're all dealing with a lot of complicated things and the world is facing all sorts of problems. This isn't the most important thing in the world. Uh, it would be really great if we can make it work for North Amherst and we're patient. We're real patient about it. And I, I guess, um, so I don't speak too many times, I'm interested if we're thinking about funding, 
whether it's for this summer starting July 1st or the next summer, because in order to uh, identify consultants who can do the research, their schedules vary. But I'm just really grateful that people are interested in the project. It's a pretty cool project in terms of uh, uncovering North Amherst uh, history. In, in, 1790, in, in 1775, at the time of the revolution, there were already six mills along the Mill River in North Amherst. It's amazing. Yeah, it really was an industrial. Yeah. Uh, industrial they, focus. Yeah. Um, Saw mills and uh, paper mills. It's pretty cool. Um, Robin, I see your hand. I heard my mute. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think both the Historic Commission and the um, CPAC are interested in figuring out if and how this can move forward. And it's given us an opportunity to really get more clarity on what we can and can't allow, which has come up a few times now. So it's actually um, uh, it's actually a good development uh, <laughs> to, to have more information as opposed to less. So. If I could just add one thing, it's, you know, it's one of the few, I'm on the participatory budgeting commission. We're trying to figure out how um, res regular old residents can propose things to the town. And this is one of the very few tools that there, that exists for people in town to propose things uh, for funding that they think would be important to have. So I'm, I have like a double interest in this. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I had one last uh, thought, um, which I don't think I had expressed earlier, just whether, I guess this is for Ben or Jane, whether or not um, what could be included would be a National Register nomination for this space, if that was appropriate. That's interesting. So there's a National Historic Register status for I'm pointing that way down toward we you know where the black walnut in and the library and the church are i don't know it'd be interesting to explore that yeah i i think it would be an easy thing to explore through uh, through the national park service i think landmark listing is handled somewhere else but it would be a district so that'd be easy easy enough to explore um um, there's one other thing I was thinking about. Um, oh, it, it was sort of a question for you, Robin, about um, so the, now, so there is time now for the for CPAC to try to work through this with the Historical Commission. Does this need to, I mean, is this a is, is this something that the town council, the attorney should, should look at, do you think? Um, I think that before we would go to the town council, I think what the CPAC wants is these particular documents. I think we have three or four of them that, you know, lay out, uh, they have their things about maintenance, there are things about, you know, all the other categories of, um, of CPAC money as well, um, and then specific things about historic preservation and then understanding this administration clause. But yeah, I suppose if the town felt like, you know, they took this guidance from the DOR, if they felt like it was appropriate to take that to town council too, we just want clarity. <laughs> That's what we want, this clarity of how something like this unfolds. It seems like it fits, and it seems like we've never really done it this way before. and. I don't think anyone was, uh, no one on the committee was familiar with this document, which actually came up last cycle with the Jones Library. So there was some language in there that was questioning whether the Jones Library was allowable. And, um, you know, we're all sort of grappling with this little piece of information and that, that little piece of information there. And so I'm trying to get all these documents together so that the CPEC members can all have them and the town can refer to them and we can all be on the same page. Did that answer your question, Jane? I feel like I went 
right. on a little longer. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah, that, that answer, yeah. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like there's this like question that has to be answered before we get to the next question. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can get that, uh, those materials to Ben and um, to Anthony as well, so that when the next round of meetings comes around, we can all be talking about it together. Okay. And Ben, I assume should, maybe I should send that to Nate as well. Yeah, or, yeah, you can yeah. include him. Great, okay. thank you so much, Robin. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Pleasure. Thank you for uh, working on this. Um, now I remember what it was I was trying to think of. It, and it does have to do with uh, National Register District nomination. Um, that it's a uh, el uh, eligible sites um, in one reading reading of one document. Uh, uh, the the resource needs to be named significant either by the local historical commission or by um, its designation as a district or a con contributing property to a district. So we'd have to do one of those two things, no matter what, I think. I was thinking that, that the uh, National Register nomination might be part of the result of the, you know, the survey proposal, okay. like one of the deliverables there, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, Jan? Sorry, I missed part of what you said. It must be named by us as significant or, what's the second one? Um, as significant or as uh, uh, part of a national registered district or listed on the national register, either individually or as a contributing property. Okay, so those are two separate things. So it's either significant or on the national register. Yeah, um, if it's on the national register, it's automatically eligible uh, if it's not on the National Register, the local historical commission needs to assert that it is significant to the town's history and heritage. So we don't do the second part. We only do the first part. So I'm just having trouble understanding this. We would either name it significant or it needs to be part already yes. of the National District. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, other uh, thoughts or comments from commission members or, or Ben? Or Meg? Oops, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Meg. Okay, thank you, Meg going above and beyond and really appreciate it. Thank we'll you. keep plugging away at it and- um, Well, and however it turns out, thank you anyway, whatever, we'll, it'll be good. Okay. And All this, right. cool. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see. Um, I am going to take uh, the opportunity to depart the meeting. So have a good night, everyone. Okay, thank you. All good right. night, Robin. Feel you. better. Feel better. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Um, let's see. So we can, um, Robin, uh, of particular interest to her was the agenda item about discussion of the Dakin estate. So we will um, move that to next month's agenda or our next meeting agenda. Um, is there uh, information about the Civil War tablets? Yes, finally. Um, so I am happy to announce finally that the, after 25 years in storage in a DPW garage in North Amherst, the Civil War tablets, 18, 1893 Civil War tablets, marble Civil War tablets have been moved by the town to uh, the bank center where they're being uh, stored uh, kind of for a short to medium term. Uh, the tablets were moved um, 
with great care by a, uh, we ended up contracting with Granite Creations. They're a counter, literally a count, countertop company. And we chose them because of their experience with moving heavy slabs of stone. Um, and they did a fantastic job, uh, used specialized dollies and handling equipment. Um, they estimated the tablets were around each like 600 to 800 pounds. So they're not small by any means. Uh, again, one of their, the biggest ones are almost seven feet long by five feet high. These are big structures. Um, I think due to COVID, oh, well, there's a few things. Due to COVID, the vaccine clinics are happening in the bank center. So that creates a, you know, a lot of activity in that building to begin with. And then two, we're just for now limiting access to the whole room it's called, which is where the tablets are being held just out of, you know, concern for social distancing and, you know, don't want too many people gathering in, in, in interior spaces. Um, but yeah, we also had uh, Irving Slavid, who maybe some of you remember from 2010. He did the uh, original restoration on the tablets. Uh, he came um, and, you know, he was very satisfied with the condition of the tablets, uh, which was great. You know, I think we all in the back of our minds were like thinking, you know, how they were been in store. No one has seen them for 10 years. Uh, since he did his restoration and we really didn't know what the condition would be. So we were pleased, you know, there was, there was a few marks and stuff here and there just from the foam pressing up against the, uh, the tablets and the crates, but he was able to uh, um, perform whatever, restore the tablets and uh, use specialized uh, treatment to get those marks up. And uh, he's gonna provide a report uh, or an assessment in, in the form of a report uh, to us, kind of just outlining those results. Um, the next thing we're working on with the tablets, there's two things. Um, they are going to be incorporated into the upcoming Juneteenth celebration. Um, you know, these tablets have special significance to the African American community in Amherst because they list, uh, I think, seven members of the 54th. Massachusetts Regiment, which was the first uh, African American regiment in the Civil War. So very special significance. And so um, this group, we're, we're hoping to maybe have, you know, by June, many more people will be vaccinated. COVID hopefully will be, the light will be at the end of the tunnel. We're hoping it, for the Juneteenth celebration to be able to cycle people in and out of the whole room um, and make it kind of more of an exhibit space. And, you know, I think there's certainly a role for the historical commission to play. You know, we, we kind of want to make it somewhat of an exhibit with interpretive material. Um, and so there's that process. That's kind of the short-term goal. And then the long-term goal is to develop work on an art. Essentially we need, we need someone you know, an, arch an architectural expert, an uh, interpretive expert. So, you know, we're still kind of defining what we need, but we need someone who can help us, guide us in this decision about how and where these tablets can be displayed long-term, you know, for hopefully the next hundred years. And so we, you know, obviously they're museum quality, you know, priceless artifacts. We want to find a place for them where they can be you know, open to the public, have interpretive material, um, but also, you know, not be, you know, vandalized and be climate controlled and be safe, essentially. So we, you know, this is, again, this is like maybe the third iteration of this project, you know, over the past 25 years to try to get to a final answer. But we're hoping, you know, there's momentum being built around it. And we think if we can find some sort of expert to help guide this decision. It'll provide some certainty about where they can be stored or where they can be displayed, how much it's gonna cost and other considerations. So um, that was a lot and I'm happy to kind of like, I, I took some pictures of the tablets and I'm happy to share those with the commission um, over email. And 
yeah, I just wanted to share the exciting news. It happened really, really suddenly. All of a sudden, um, the company was ready to act and we were, you know, it happened last week and all of a sudden here, <laughs> it, it all happened in, in one Tuesday morning, so. Great. Um, yeah. Jan, uh, would you like to comment and then Hetty? I just had a question. The name Irving, is it Slavin? S-L-A-V-I-N? How is it spelled? Uh, with a D at the end, Slavid. Yeah. Slavid. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and as an art historian who's worked on all sorts of things, including a lot of study of the Parthenon freeze <laughs> slabs, happy to um, be part of advice. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Hetty? I think I think what's really great about what's happened um, and thank you Ben so much for shepherding this along um, for the public good um, is to see how large these things are and how impressive they are um, I just looked at the little bit of film that Amilcar had had oh, yeah, up on yeah. social media um, as I wasn't at the event and and it was just really fantastic to see people you know, gathering around them, you know, wanting to touch them. I'm not sure that they should have been <laughs> whatever, but, but anyway, um, to be that close to, to, to some artifacts that are pretty important for around here is, is a great moment. And the fact that they're going to be on display for Juneteenth is also really great. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I add my thanks, Ben, for all your work to make this happen. It's important to the town that we are able to display these tablets. Yeah, I feel like, you know, for better or for worse, because our tablets have never had a proper storage or proper display location and have been in storage for so long. They're actually, I think they're some of the most intact Civil War tablets uh, of, of Massachusetts communities. I think most communities were given Civil War tablets in the late 1800s and many of them just put them on the side of their town hall put them in you know in a memorial somewhere and they've just succumbed to the climate and weathered significantly over time and I just you know it's probably it's a disservice that we've never had a great mm -hmm. option for displaying them but because of that ours are in great condition and we can hopefully find a permanent location so yeah, that's really exciting. This um, yeah. this advance right now is just wonderful. So thanks yeah. for all your work on that. Yeah, um, I have uh, a, a question and a and a just a thought from uh, from my work at yeah. the Dickinson Museum. Um, I'm wondering if some kind of preservation architect and maybe landscape preservation architect or preservation landscape architect might be um, it might be somehow involved as, as part of the expert team along possibly along with an engineer who could think about the environment environment yeah, yeah there's yeah there's there's mold, so many elements to it that need to be discussed. There's the, you know, we had a structural engineer look at town hall, I think, you know, before my time in the early 2000s, and they determined that the, the walls in town hall actually couldn't bear the weight mm -hmm. of the tablets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something a structural engineer needs to figure, is, is best to figure out. But then a structural engineer is not gonna know about how marble wears over time that's more of like a stone mason or something. Yeah. I don't really. And or then an architect might, yeah. 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 So yeah, it might be a team, um, or maybe it's like a you know a a, a primary consultant who then you know works with sub consultants or something. But I think it's more than we can figure out. I think, but yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I will say, Jane. I mean, it's. It's littered. I don't know which Dickinsons are which, but there's a lot, a few <laughs> Dickinsons on the on the tablets. Um, and you know, looking through the names, there's you know, Boltwoods and you know, Cowles and you know, uh, what are the others? 
lots of, I'm blanking now, but lots of recognizable Amherst yeah. names. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is sort of incidental, um, but I, there's a lovely cemetery um, up near Wildwood School, the, the Amherst Cemetery, which is sort of non-denominational and has a small chapel in a brick federal style house um, on, off of Strong Street. And it's full, the graveyard is full of the same kind of names, you know, that are on the, the memorial tablets. Um, and I'm really conscious of those tablets being names. You know, it's really, it really makes me think about Maya Lin and the Vietnam Memorial and, um, which is sort of very different from the Parthenon Frieze, which I also love like Jan. <laughs> but I, I think, being able to somehow allow the public to, to be at the right level to look at these objects is, it, is something that needs to be handled carefully um, so that they are um, accessible somehow to, to people in the way that the Vietnam Vet Memorial is to the nation, to the world. Um, because I think I think this has a, a really great potential for for the town in terms of of um, you know making visible um, something that has been hidden uh, physically hidden for the last twenty five years, but also hidden from history um, as well. Um, Jan, um, yeah, mentioning the Vietnam. Memorial by Maya Lin made me think about how when people go to that, they're able to find the name of their family member by looking in a book because it has so many names on it. But I was wondering if there'd be something similar in whatever presentation form we come up with where perhaps there would be a book people could consult that would explain that name in terms of their family connections to the town. Mm. Um, it might be a nice way to allow people who think they might be related in some way to check that, who um, it might tie into certain houses in town that belong to these people that now people own, or, you know, it would just be uh, more interactive and maybe more relevant for a larger part of the town if we could put something like that together, I don't know how we'd ever find the time and whatever, but it would be um, a nice project, sort of like the Writer's Walk project, you know, that the Historical Commission could offer the town um, to go with this. That's a neat idea. Yeah, I, I, I like that. that. Um, I love it too. Ben, did you want to show us pictures or? Um... Um, yeah, look, give me one second. And while I do that, uh, I'll also say the, uh, the, there's a book, The History of the Town of Amherst by uh, Charles Morehouse and Edward Carpenter. And they have a whole section on the, all the different regiments that served Amherst uh, and also a you know brief one or two sentence biography of each name listed on the Civil War tablets, which is- Oh, cool. Uh, great. And I think we could also, one thing we could also do is match up the names in the West Cemetery, potentially, and Wildwood Cemetery with uh, the names on the um, Civil War tablets. So yeah, here's here they are being moved on these dollies uh, to the rear of the bank center. Um, but put in place. And then here are, I think, a zoomed in picture of each of the tablets. These are the tablet number two, the uh, those who perished in the war. Um, yeah, here's, you know, a few few different Dickinsons. Uh, Stern, Stearns, I think, is an important name. Skinner, uh, Kellogg, certainly. Um, Edward Dickinson, is that Emily's? Uh, no, no. <laughs> some kind of collateral relative. There were, were by 18, I think it was by 1886, 
the Dickinsons in this area had a family reunion at which more than 2,000 people were present. Oh, wow. <laughs> so here's the dedication plaque. Hmm. And then, yeah, here's how the room is set up. Um, we had Amherst Welding, local company, fabricate these uh, A-frames. And I, you know, I find them a kind of architectural in a way. They're very sleek in their design uh, and are incredibly durable. Um, and they also match the trim on the windows in the pole room. So it's kind of, <laughs> it looks, <laughs> looks, looks nice as well. Yeah, as you see back here. Um, That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, and again, they're in great, great shape. Maybe a little, uh, uh, what did Irving said, you know, the, the wear and tear you'd expect to see on, oh, you know, tablets that are 140, 30 years old. So, yeah, here's a small event we had. Yeah, so happy, glad to be able to finally report good news about the Civil War tablets. And I will, you know, this, I don't think this is the last you'll hear of it where there's that working group of uh, Anika Lopez and her mother, Deborah Bridges and Dr. Shabazz, Demetria Shabazz that are kind of more focused on the Juneteenth celebration, but that, you know, involves the historical and interpretive material as well. So I think, you know, there's a role for the historical commission to play, um, however much or little you'd like to be involved. So we'll maybe can bring this up at the next meeting as a discussion point. So. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, do you have thoughts about um, the role of the historical commission? Um, I think, I mean, I think there's, there's kind of this, I think the, the working, we're calling them the Civil War Tablets Working Group, that there's room for, you know, whether, you know, they come to historical group commission meetings or members go to some of their informal meetings. I think there's room for involvement in both ways. Um, and I think, especially developing the room as, a, as kind of an exhibit space, um, which involves there being interpretive material. Uh, you know, ultimately it's town staff that does the work, which means, well, that's not totally true, but I think it, it, a lot will fall to me and maybe Nate and uh, Jeremiah LaPlante, who's the facilities manager. So I think getting guidance from an input and uh, from multiple sources would be great. And you know, maybe there's small projects to do along the way, like, hey, could, would someone be interested in, you know, putting together a, you know, brief bio of, you know, this name or that name, maybe we could kind of divvy up some work that way. Um, so I'm not totally sure what it's all going to look like, but that's kind of just my initial thoughts. Ben, um, yes. how long will it be possible to keep the exhibit at the bank center so yeah that's a good question that that came up yesterday the uh you know the town manager paul bockelman dave zomack were you know uh there on tuesday um and kind of talked about that question there's kind of the short term medium term and then you know eventually long term home for the tablets short term you know they're fine being in the in the pole room it's you know under lock and key because of COVID, the, the building's not really open to the public except for vaccinations. Um, in the medium term, as things do start opening up, uh, you know, maybe in the fall, I think, you know, the tablets, they're not easy to move and we don't wanna have to move them again. And I think uh, they are fine. You know, they're, they're an important priority and there, there could, there's still room to, to have, you know, the poll room is often used by the senior center for like the various events and classes and activities. Um, there's still room for small gatherings to happen in the poll room and we could like partition off that space. Um, so, you know, and I think there will always be like a staff person in there and, and, the, and the room can be locked when there's no one in there. So I think, 
they're safe to stay in there. Um, and, you know, hopefully for the, hopefully yes, for just... the foresee foreseeable future, but not too long. So we want to find a permanent home for them. But I just was envisioning your your commenting on the history of Amherst book that lists the regiments and some of the people noted on the tablets that if if they're going to be there for a while to maybe have a legend for each tablet with the short biographical note, the name, mm -hmm. and whatever else we can have, because that would be a start if there's a more permanent place to um, develop the legend in, a, in maybe a different format. To, but to have a, a start at that, kind of like the writer's walk, getting, getting all the information and having it, but it, it, could, it could happen in you know, a legend on the wall for each plaque um, as a start to historical yeah. context. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hmm. Well, again, very exciting. And uh, yeah, maybe we should put this on the agenda for the next meeting to talk a little more in more detail or more specifically about what the historical, how the historical commission could be involved. I like the legend idea. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that Carpenter and Morehouse is out of, out of copyright. We could kind of PDF the, the one or two sentence bios um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Could you do that, Ben, and send them to us just so we can get an idea of how extensive it is and for yep, before, yeah, it's available. before our next meeting and it'll give us some some meat to, to begin that conversation? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Thank I, you. I think you can even get it on um, Google through Hathi Trust or um, Google yeah, Google. I found it here. Just that it's called archive.org. I just Google. I just sure enough, I got a link from somewhere, but um, mm -hmm. I, I will certainly send this material around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, so let's see. Preservation bylaw is next. Do we? Um. So <laughs> I was hoping that I could have gotten feedback from Nate, Rob, and Chris by now. It's, you know, certainly been a while. I think, mm -hmm. as some of you may know, the planning department has been tasked with a whole lot of zoning proposals uh, by the town council. And so, you know, I was asked to help out with a separate zoning bylaw focused on, you know, accessory apartments and so that kind of took up my time. Nate had Nate was also helping with demo delay bylaw. He was asked to, you know, basically rewrite the bylaw or, you know, focus exclusively on, you know, affordable housing, mixed use buildings, you know, businesses downtown and zoning there. So we've been stretched a little thin in the, suffice it to say the demolition delay bylaw has, I've wor I worked on it a little bit earlier this month. I, I kind of, took a stab at, um, I didn't change any kind of substance. All I did was kind of re rework the bylaw. So it has this new kind of element to it of uh, like a, a certificate that's granted by the commission. Um, and then that's, that's the kind of what an applicant needs to get a demolition permit or they're, you know, given what I called like a or a preservation order, I think I called it. So that's, that would be like a order grant, uh, given by the historical commission to, that a, to the building commissioner that a demolition permit cannot be granted for uh, 12 mm. months. Um, so I, I like kind of reworked the bylaw in that way. And then I sent it to like Nate, Rob and Chris for feedback and that's kind of the step where we're at now. I haven't really heard back yet. Um, so, you know, I'm really hoping to push it along uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I think the, you know, this is when all the committees get busier with more applications, whether it's the planning board or historical commission, we're all gonna 
uh, be busier now. So um, hopefully in the next, you know, month or so we can get the, ultimately, I mean, you, the historical commission needs to feel comfortable with the final draft, town staff need to feel comfortable with the final draft. And then it, again, it's the process of presenting it to town council, then they refer it to the planning board, and then it moves through this whole cycle of review and approvals. And um, I just hope we can get to that point soon. But I know it's, it's something that we should kind of like move off of our plate. Uh, yeah, thanks for working on that. And um, it, it is, uh, so with all of the bylaw rewriting, does the town council just take up what's ready when it's ready? Or it, are, are they looking at bylaw rewrites in batches or how's that working? Um. <laughs> I, my understanding is that they, they kind of have a, their subcommittee, which is the CRC, the Community Resources Committee, mm -hmm. has a priority of zoning, zoning priorities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, demolition delay bylaws on there, but it's just like the fourth thing down. Mm -hmm. And so we were working on the first three items. And so um, we haven't, yeah, I guess we, yeah, what did we do? We formally pre just presented our proposals for the three things. Um, and I, I believe that uh, that then initiates this process of review and approval and, um, and you know, deliberation and, and all of that. So I think that's kind of their first batch. Um, and, you know, they are, well, you know, I think we're free to, as long as we give them like a, some notice, we can put in our um, historical commission mm -hmm. uh, proposal. Um, and that, and that'll begin that process. So okay. what I'm not, what I'm not sure about is the, uh, is whether state law or the town charter has a limit, has a Time start is there a time a specific timeline for when they have to uh, make a hold a hearing on a bylaw? That's what I'm not sure about. I know when it's a group of citizens that put in a petition for a bylaw, there's a very specific clock that happens, but I'm just not sure what happens when a town committee puts in a bylaw. But mm -hmm. I can look into that more. Thank you. Um, Pat, is your hand freshly up? No, I just was stifling a yawn, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, um, okay, we're closing in. Um, do, do, we don't, do we have minutes to approve? We don't have minutes to approve. I, um, I, I, I wasn't sure what Nate or other staff people have done in the past, whether, um, you know, I know Jane Scheffler has been taking notes, you know, in the past few months or weeks, she's like emailed some drafts around. Uh, I know Jan provided some feedback. So I, I don't know, do we like, I know other committees like formerly adopt minutes, but, um, you know, I think it's important to keep, uh, you know, keep, uh, minutes. I, I post them on the website every so often um, so that people can review past meetings. So I think um, I'd like to do that soon, but I just want to make sure everyone is, has, if they want to, has reviewed them. And if we need to formally adopt them, then we do that. But if not, I'll just post them. So yeah, I, th I think they, they should be sent out with the agenda. Oh, I see two, two uh, let's see, Jan and Pat. Jan would. Yeah, I just I have responded every time she sent one out with um, and then she always says she's going to incorporate those and um, have them ready, but they haven't come back. So I think we need to remind her that we need the corrected versions on the agenda so that we can then review them in preparation for a vote. 
because uh, I think that's the part we're missing um, in order to have them official and then you can post them. I, I think they need to be approved. It, it seems to me they were earlier on in my tenure. We used to. Committee. We always yeah. used to use the formal process and it's just kind of fallen apart. We're like six months behind and she's been sending them in fours and twos and ones, but then we don't see them again. And I don't think she realizes that she has to take the next step with them. I think, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm kind of missing a step here, but I, I think to formally approve them, they should, should be listed by date on the agenda and, and the minutes, the final version sent out with the agenda. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, maybe we can say next meeting, I'll get in touch with Jane Scheffler. I will collect all of the minutes that she has. Um, and then next meeting, when I'll, I'll send them out for everyone to review, and then next meeting, I'll list them out in the agenda, and then we'll. Okay, thank you. That'd be great. Um, and uh, for information uh, of commission members, um, Jane has found that um, taking care of six month old twin boys is going to inhibit her ability to continue on the commission. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry that she's, uh, yeah. she, she's, uh, loved it and, and hopes to return. But for right now, she, she just can't. Uh, so should we be looking for a replacement? Yeah, I, um, I had a email correspondence with uh, the town manager's office. Because um, I know, you know, obviously, we, we were at six members. And then, you know, they, the town manager's office was like, you know, we're so busy with running this vaccine clinic, blah, 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 blah. Like it's not, doesn't seem like there's major urgency to fill like the one vacancy. But I think now that we're at five, uh, you know, if we will start running into quorum issues and obviously, you know, we just want to be fully, have the full suite of members that uh, the commission is supposed to have. So the local historic district also is short one member. So I've asked uh, the town manager's office to kind of formally advertise and solicit uh, uh, applications for volunteer members of for the historical commission and one for the local historic district. So hopefully, I don't. Hopefully that process can uh, take place soon. Um, but so yeah, I. I'm sorry, Ben. I, I just the number that's on the Amherst Historical Commission can be seven. Is that correct? So correct. we really need we really could use two new volunteers. Two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think the the town the typically what they do is, you know, you know, using the website, using social media, using various, you know, an email list they'll you know send out the announcement for vacancies and then give a period of time for people to submit applications and then there's you know a interview process and um but i think we had a conversation maybe a few months ago about maybe leaning towards someone with a little bit of architectural expertise i seem to remember kind of just to help guide mm -hmm. some of the demolition mm -hmm. uh, discussions. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, is that is that still something that makes I sense? I asked a few colleagues about people in architecture at UMass and I got no response. Um, yeah. I think they would suggest names. So, but I think we need to keep up on that. Yeah, is, is there anyone maybe in your, uh, I hope everyone's enjoying the Deerfield course uh, on architecture, yeah. but maybe if there's anyone in that class or affiliated with that program. We don't, see, program. Right now. We don't yeah. see it, but we just see the guy teaching it. Oh, that's right, yeah. It's all virtual, but that's a great course. It's intense, but really good. Good. 
Um, all right, let's see. Um, are there announcements? Do we want to say anything about writer's walk or wait? I guess. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, you can say a few words if you'd like, Jan. Um, well, just that uh, the signs have been fabricated and DPW is soon going to be putting them in the ground and then Artifex puts the skins on them uh, after they're in the ground, apparently. And then um, meanwhile, I've been working on the website, which, you know, was originally done um, as the result of a course at UMass back at least 15 years ago, approximately. And um, the uh, professor John Olson had reworked it for this historic site that he maintains along with a Civil War tour. Um, and I had worked from that for many of the sign texts. Um, and I have since gone in and amended, corrected, and edited all the entries, added some images, um, he's helped me move some map dots and I reorganize the entries to fit the tour as we have it now and the directions to each house from the previous one. And we're just about ready. Um, Jane is going to get me text for the Emily Dickinson house because that's added. They didn't have that in the, the student projects. And um, what else? I just need a better photo of uh, the Lord, the Boltwood Inn. And then when um, we upload the photos and text for the Dickinson house, he has a new photo from me um, for Norton Jester's house, which I got from Steve Bloom, who lives there now. And, um, and then a new photo of the inn will be ready to roll. Very exciting, Jan. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. all your work on it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I've learned a lot about the town and also um, how much you can be misled by um, text that's already there if you don't research every single word. Yeah. Um, but I think we're good. And Jane and Ben, if we could have five minutes at the end of the meeting to just finalize a couple questions. Oh yeah, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, any other announcements? Uh, then um, this can be a public comment period. Um, if there is um, any member of the public who wishes to address the commission. Then um, unanticipated items. Uh, I have one, one thing I'd like to, uh, raise and if we can maybe have a little time at our next meeting. Um, you may have heard that the Emily Dickinson Museum is doing a pretty substantial restoration at the, at the homestead. Um, and it, the, um, I'm not sure that there is going to be a formal demolition permit uh, that might depend on how the building commissioner interprets um, the request. The, the, um, we do need to take our project to the local historic district commission. Um, I'm not sure if a demolition permit is going to be triggered because basically what we're doing uh, on the visible facade of the building is to restore the 19th century front door that we have recovered from the garage behind the homestead. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> but whether or not we do have a, you know, come to the commission with a, a demolition permit application, I'd like to share the project with you and have a little sort of PowerPoint thing I can walk through in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Sounds um, great, Jane. Yes, that would be wonderful. Great, wonderful. Um, and um, so we can maybe put that on the next agenda because I'd like you all to see what's going on before we uh, start demolition. <laughs> so, um, 
so there's that. I don't know, are there any other un unanticipated items? Then let's uh, set or just remember what our next meeting date is. Hmm. And I apologize for having to change this meeting date, but I'm glad. Most of yeah. Um, let's see, I might have it written down what our next meeting is. I have April 21st. April 21st and then uh, May 19th. The next two meetings. I have I have those on my calendar as well, Ben. Me too. We're trying to do the third Wednesday of every month. Correct. Yeah. Looks good here. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's see. Um, do I? Is there a motion for us to adjourn? I, I can make that motion for us to <laughs> please please adjourn. For our head. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Aye. 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 Good night, Aye. everybody. Be Aye. well. Aye. Ben and Jane, Aye. don't forget to stay. Okay. Oh. <sighs> <sighs> Hey. Uh, that's six pages, single spaced. Wow. Um, Those are some minutes. Well, I was trying to be detailed because of the touchy nature of the meeting. I just thought it'd be best if I record pretty much everything so nobody can, you know, say, well, that's not what was said. Um, so I was just wondering about my recent emails. Um, is it, do you agree, Jane, that we should just take the Dell off of both signs and not try to assign it? Yeah, um, you know, after all this back and forth about it, I might be slightly inclined to think of the five colleges house as, as the Dell. Me too. But just in case somebody comes along at some point and says, absolutely not, it was the name of that, or both houses or the house that was moved, I thought it'd be easier just not to put it. I think that's fine. And it also saves us fixing one sign. You know, we only have to take it off one. We don't have to put it on the other. So yeah, I, I think it, it's, you know, it's just an invitation for someone to do their own research. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, it will be mentioned in the website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which can be fixed anytime if new information comes along. It's just a sign that I thought would be better to have a little more anonymous about it. I think that makes sense, yeah. And then the Charles Eastman house um, and Elaine Goodale, what do you think about that? I would love it if, if we could put Elaine Goodale on there. Great. Yeah. Well, we have her picture, luckily, because I had oh, already cool. put that on the sign. So all we need to do is add to the name. And do you think it should be Charles and Elaine Eastman or Charles Eastman and Elaine Goodale house? You know, in like in our our museum convention right now is to it would be to say uh, Charles Eastman and Elaine Goodale Eastman. Right, which is what I have in the website, but it gets too long. Yeah. So um, I get the sign. So I just thought you yeah. know, it's either both names or just put her first name in. But then I hate it because she published under Goodale and she and they divorced, you know, or they didn't divorce. They separated and they used separate names. Then I think Elaine Goodale. OK, so um, Ben, I should should I talk to Seth? Do you want to talk to Seth? It's just two signs then that need changing on those two um, small. Yeah, areas. you you understand the changes better than I do. So it, okay. if, if you want to just talk to Seth and, you know, if I need, I'll just say, you know, I were the ones paying him technically. So I can say, I approve you doing this work. Um, okay. And, he can talk uh, with you if he doesn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going to tear his hair out and say, you again? Oh my God. Another I know. Uh, have this happen all the time though. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think it's totally fine. I mean, they, they, uh, my understanding is the uh, 
the like the side this boards are already in like attached to the pole right now but the the actual content of the sign is just like a vinyl skin that i think just like plasters over and so mm -hmm. they can send out a technician and just install a new like skin i guess to go so over if they ever had to update them um, or change them for some reason would they just apply over that one or would they have to take the first one off do you know uh, i guess i'm not totally sure but it seems easy and easy enough for that's what they i mean it sounds like it's like. parking decal on your bumper that you eventually get so thick you know they stick out. yeah yeah <laughs> and so i've um i told them that you know i it's hard for me sometimes to communicate with dpw like i don't i don't know where in the DPW building, the signs are right now. So if I sent, if I told them to come out now and do the replacement, I, I would need to tell someone from DBW to unlock the door and blah, 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 coordinate that. So I think it's easier just to like wait till these things are in the ground. And then, you know, we can tell the technician exactly where the <laughs> sign is. Right. And maybe we like coordinate it. So it's like the day after it's installed, we can quickly get the new updated right. material on there and then you know i think well, there the won't be any material on there right right now there's nothing on them so it won't be updated it'll just be the skin that goes on it'll be the first one it'll be the correct one right they don't have anything on them right no, now No, my understanding is that there is the first the, the first print that we sent them is in the sign right now oh it is on i thought the skin yeah. didn't go on until they were yeah. up it's uh, yeah. okay that was so, okay I think, I mean, I, I guess the next conversation I want to have with you guys or maybe the whole historical commission is one, do we need to contact the home, the property owners again to let them know that, you know, DPW is going to put a sign in their yard and two, you know, just like kind of building, um, you know, doing maybe press release or, you know, building some you know, having, getting the town involved in like social media or something, so. Yes and yes, I think we should. I have the names and addresses from the original letters. I think we should send something out and say, okay, this project is finally coming to a conclusion. You know, these signs are gonna be mounted. And does Dave you know, know exactly how far from the street and, and where to put them at each address? Um, I thought I saw a drawing, but. Yeah, I would have to confirm with Nate because I've seen. You know, that. sometimes there's a sidewalk, sometimes there's not. You know, yeah. low zone up in the north end. Um, it's there's really, it's 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 just a road that you know, Market Hill. There's nothing there. I mean, it's so different to say on a Lincoln district where there's like, uh, yeah, you know, a, a boulevard of grass and stuff like that. So they know how to handle that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, you know, they know where the town right of way begins and ends. So, okay, um, great. Okay, well, so I think you we definitely do a press release, but maybe once we have a date for our little launch, um, I did tell John Olson that um, we were going to do something outdoors once they were in, um, and that. He, if any of the students who wrote the entries were around um, in the area, he should invite them. Uh, Steve Bloom is also interested. Anybody who owns a house of one of the writers mm -hmm. you know, should be invited. I think we should send out very specific invitations. In fact, in that letter where we say that they're going to come, why don't we also say watch the paper for the public launch and please you're invited to attend. Then we don't have to send them something separate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, or I can say like, you know, send me an email. So I have your email and phone number or something. Um, all right. So do you have, you have that mailing list or is, is that? Something? I can go back and look for it. Um, I had used a mail program that automatically filled in addresses. So if I saved the file with the addresses, um, I should still have them. And I'm, you know, I don't know. People may have moved. This was what? Four or five years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, is there a way okay. for me to check that? If I give them to you, can you check that the homeowner is the same name? Is, is there a way? Yeah, um, I can check the most recent owner up to like 2019. That's in the assessor's card. So. Okay. Um, but oh, yeah, nice. that sounds like a good next step. Of course, I need to get DPW to like. 
actually commit, put them in. Commit to a date to install them and they have their hands full right now. So <laughs> we'll see. I need to send Guilford a bribe or something. Or could we do it around the time students are moving out so parents are here? Or is there a is there an event coming up where parents show up? I mean, I know people aren't supposed to be in much contact, but it's getting better. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure what's going on at, at UMass for commencement, but Amherst is planning on a kind of seniors only in-person commencement. Um, It'd be a good day if, it, if there aren't so many events that this would just be lost in yeah. the program, you know. Maybe, it, 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 what would that be, a Sunday? Is that when they usually do them? I think so, yeah. Maybe we could do it on the Saturday, have a weekend event, you know, related, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Okay, well, let's think about that. Yeah. Great, thanks, Ben. This is still recording, so. Oh, shoot, you're right. <laughs> We're official. <laughs> um, so I'll